Okay. Welcome to our game theory lesson on indefinitely repeated games. Uh, unlike repeatedly repeated games, which are finitely repeated, you know, there's only a certain frame of time, indefinitely or sometimes called infinitely repeated games, uh, go on without a known ending time. And as we're going to see, it really does change the nature of uh, the analysis, the results, and in many ways indefinitely repeated games are probably the more realistic tool to use in a lot of cases. So if a game is played repeatedly without a definite end in sight, what we do is we treat the game as if it were repeated infinitely many times. So as if it were going to go on forever. So that's the reason these are sometimes called infinitely repeated. But in order to do this, uh, we need to have some discount for the future. Uh, otherwise, if current period was worth the same as a future period and there was no discounting for the future, right? if you get a payoff of $10 from now until infinity, that's an infinite amount of money. right? But if you are to be paid $10 now every day that you're alive, right? well, it's there's an indefinite amount of time where that's going to happen. So, you know, it's not going to be infinite, though. We treat it as an infinite game, but we discount the future because there's some probability the game ends. So payments utility received in the future uh, are generally discounted. Why? Well, there's the two reasons. One, the game could end, right? There's some probability the game could end. But on top of that, money or utility is generally worth more now. Right? If I asked the question, would you rather have $100 today or $101 a year from now? Or $103 a year from now, right? Many people would take the $100 today. Well, money right now is worth more than money a year from now to a lot of people. So generally that does hold. Um, so the money could be worth more now, also the probability of the game end. These are the two reasons we do discount games in the future. So how do we discount this? Well, we're going to use the Greek symbol delta for that. And I say, what, ha what, what would it mean if we have a delta that equals 0 0.98? Well, if delta equals 0 0.98, that indicates that the next period, uh, any payment received is only worth 98% of the payment that's received in this period. So that's what the 0.98 is telling us. If it's 0.5, it means any payment received in the next period is only worth half of what the same payment in this period is worth to the player of the game. So the discount factor of 0.98, the payment or utility is worth only 98% of what it was worth to the player in the previous period. Um, so in a way, it's kind of like the opposite of an inflation rate, right? Like the inflation rate, if it's you know, if you have an inflation rate of 2%, that's saying money is not quite worth as much now as it was in the past. When we use a delta, we're saying, well, the money now is only worth 98 cents on the dollar of what it's worth in the future. So how can we use this discount factor, discount factor to determine present and future utility? What we're going to have to do here and the general no notion of how these games are set up is if you have some dilemma in a one-time game, we're going to be looking at, is it worth cooperating? Is the expected value of the, all of the payments by cooperating exceed the benefits the player would get by cheating on the agreement to get that higher payment one time? So we have to, in order to do that, we're going to have to be able to use this discount factor and plug it into a mathematical formula to determine how much is it worth, what's the expected value. So let's go with the discount rate of 0.8 or a discount factor of 0.8, 0 0.8. In the initial period, how much, how do you apply that 0.8? Well, it's 0.8 to the zeroth power. Well, anything to the zeroth power is equal to one, which means the current payment is worth whatever the current payment is worth, right? If I give you $5,000 today, and every year from now, 
the, any amount of money you receive is only worth 0.8, well, today's one is still worth $5,000. Now, next year's is worth only 0.8 of 5,000, and the year after that is only worth 0.8 times the 0.8 of $5,000. But right now, you know, in the current period, it's 0.8 to the zeroth power. In the next period, it's 0.8 to the first power, which is 0.8, of course. Then the following, it's 0.8 squared. The one after that, it would be 0.8 cubed, and so on and so on. So what would be the expected value? If you receive some payment per period um, from now until forever, what's it worth to you? Well, you'd take that payment, multiply it by 0.8 to the zeroth power, multiply it by 0.8 to the first power, by 0.8 to the second power, by 0.8 to the third power, and so on and so on and so on, plus 0.8 to the infinite, inf you know, 0.8 to infinity. Right? This is, you get that payment times each of these, as you can see, simplifying instead of distributing. Well, there is a mathematical formula uh, if you study limits and do not have to prove how this formula works. But if you have any number to the zeroth power, and then to the first power, and then to the second power, and then to the third and the fourth, and you add them together, right? Notice these, are, these keep getting smaller, right? 0.8 to the first power, this is 0 0.64. 0 0.64 times 0 0.08, I don't know off the top of my head exactly what that is. It's about 0.5, right? Because 0.8 times 0.6 is 0.48 but we're dealing with 0.64, so it's, it's around 0.5. But then to the fourth power is to, you know, 0.8 times that number. I mean, these, these just keep getting smaller and smaller. And any number to the infinite power is zero. So this is going to converge to some number, and what it converges to is one divided by one minus 0.8. So if you started trying to add this up in your head, this is one plus 0.8, so that's 1.8, plus 0.64, well, that's 2.8. Uh, 4, 4, plus another 0.5 or so, so it's about 2.94, and so on and so on, that will end up converging to an expected value of 5. So if you were to receive $1 now and every year for the rest of your life, and you had a discount rate of 0.8, that to you would be worth Five dollars. That's the expected value to you based on how much you're discounting in the future. So one way to think of that, another way to think of that is if you were willing to receive a dollar, um, you know, there, you would be just as happy getting a dollar every day the rest of, or every year the rest of your life as five dollars right now. This is actually something the lotteries do. Like, you know, lotteries deal with do you want to receive a lump sum or a payout over time. One former student in the class, uh, actually, that was the final paper, was looking at uh, when would it be smart for lottery recipients to receive lump sum payments versus when would it be smart for them to receive the kind of the annuity, the ongoing payment for a number of years. So the general discount factor is noted by delta. A greater delta means a less less of a discount for the future, right? If a delta of 0.98 means the next period is worth 0.98, a delta of 0.5 means the next period is worth 0.5. The expected present value of a future stream of payments is one divided by one minus delta. It's a key formula. I should have the little Zeke point by this, because this is something you absolutely will need to know when when we're going through our repeated games. So if a game is indefinitely repeated, what are we going to be looking at? Well, you're going to be looking at what is the stream of payments for cooperating, multiplying it by that formula, and then what is the expected payments if you instead defect, right? And logically, if you defect, you're going to get a larger payment once and then smaller payments every other period. So we have to have some idea of what the strategy a player would have going into the game. So we would say a player could perhaps play a non-cooperative strategy, or could be cooperative, but we're not going to say our players are so dumb that they're only going to be cooperative, right? If our player attempts to be cooperative and his or her opponent is not, we're going to say there's a trigger. And the trigger is that if the opponent is not cooperative, you decide not to be cooperative, but exactly how, well, one of the ways we will 
say our players, one of the strategies we'll say our players can play is the tit for tat strategy, which we've already described uh, in the previous lesson. The other one's the grim strategy. A grim strategy occurs when a player will choose to cooperate with another player as long as the other player continues to cooperate. Uh, however, if the other player ever defects and chooses not to cooperate, our player will always defect in the future, and hence the name Grimm. You ever choose not to cooperate, I will never cooperate with you again throughout the rest of time. Well, it's the Grimm strategy. So the Grimm strategy, um, you know, cooperate. If your opponent defects, you'd always defect. The tit-for-tat strategy says that you'll cooperate if your opponent defects, you will respond by defecting in the next time period. So the rule is you play cooperate until your opponent defects, but then you retaliate by playing the defect in the following round. What the tit-for-tat strategy indicates, though, is if your opponent defects, then you then uh, starts to cooperate again. You can cooperate with them again in the future. If your I mean, it's maybe not likely to occur, but it can occur. The Grimm strategy would indicate it will never happen. So the example that we're going to go through, two firms sell the same product. They could price low or price high. Here's the payoff matrix. Right? If they both price high, they each get four. If they both price low, they only get $3 in profits each. But if one of them prices low, while the other price is high, the one who prices low reaps all the profits. So ten dollars in profit for for that individual for uh, or for that firm for pricing low. What is the Nash equilibrium if this game is played only once? What's the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium if this game is repeated a finite number of times? Those are the two questions that I want you to consider um, for coming to class. Then we're also going to work out um, what happens if our players in this game uh, would have, if this is an indefinitely repeated game and the players choose to play either the Grimm strategy or a tit-for-tat strategy, and how would that influence? Um, how does that, does that make any difference? So for now, I want you to go through these two questions, and we'll resume with this in class.